Welcome to the Muscle Intelligence Podcast. I'm your host, Ben Pekulski. Have you ever heard the phrase, the way you do anything is the way you do everything? We all know that you can change the circumstance, but wherever you go, there you are. Today's guest is absolutely brilliant and is going to provide you with some mind-blowing, applicable information that you can literally take right now to start changing your mind and changing your life changing your self-talk, accomplishing more goals. Jacques Taylor is a very good close personal friend of mine who, in my opinion, is changing the world. Jacques has uh, developed a thought process and a system around using exercise. Any exercise that you're currently doing could be something as simple as walking, could be yoga, could be training, could be literally anything, to change your emotions, to change your brain. Jacques does an absolutely phenomenal job in this podcast describing how we can literally create new mindsets and new emotions, doing the things we're already doing in life, intentionally building workouts, intentionally building our life. So fascinated by this conversation. It's been a huge addition to my arsenal and to my tool belt recently. I absolutely love Jacques as a human being. He is a nerd just like me, and hopefully just like many of you. Um, We absolutely love this stuff. We absolutely geek out about it. And uh, we, you know, this is one of the most exciting things that we talk about on a day-to-day basis, neuroscience, how the brain works, the interactions of the nervous system, the brain with your environment, with your body, and ultimately how to hack the system. If you liked the previous episodes on neuroscience and brain hacking, you're going to love this conversation with Jacques Taylor. Today's podcast is brought to you guys by Bubs, Bubs Naturals. Um, head over to bubsnaturals.com and absolutely take advantage of this massive discount they're offering, 20% off collagen and MCT. And people have asked, hey, Ben, why do you use collagen and MCT? Well, if you're sick, if you're run down, if this immune stuff is running you down, you need collagen because we need glycine to produce glutathione. Glycine also ha- and, and collagen also has tremendous other benefits in the body from gut health to hair, skin, and nails. Um, and many other amazing benefits. And MCT, if you're any, ever drinking coffee, if you're ever adding milk to it, stop and start an MCT powder. And this stuff is the most dissolvable and, and amazing tasting stuff that exists. And if you're on a ketogenic diet, both of these are essential staples. Bubsnaturals.com. Head over there and use the code intelligence to get 20% off because we love you. We appreciate you guys supporting the podcast. Enjoy this incredible, incredible conversation with Jacques Taylor. If you do enjoy it, listen all the way to the end. Share with one person you know and love. And anyone who works out and wants to ultimately change your mind, realize, guys, working out is not something you have to do. It's something you get to do. And as soon as you change that perspective, you can start tapping into all these amazing opportunities that exist within creating your greatest life. Enjoy the show. So that becomes the that becomes the other important thing to to sometimes not cling so so strongly to what you did yesterday because what you might come up with this week oh, man it might be radically different and it might give you infinitely more right so we have to learn to to trust that mind flow as opposed to trying to cling to a mindset yeah, that's so beautiful. And I speak about that sometimes. Like we, we experience those, like I think a lot of bodybuilders and athletes attached to having to train angry, right? And, and oh. angry gets them a result. And they're like, hey, you know what? I've got this far in anger. But then I, yeah. I make that proposition you just did there is, well, what if that was only 30%? Yep. What if there was still 70% left to go? You know, David Goggins says that's 40%. And you've got this, this 60% untapped. Yeah. The untapped could be this state of joy and elation and like, bliss where you're like that was hard now it just became easy now yes. i can flow in this for exponentially longer harder yeah. and and to become ultimately a new person yes and and that is the thing is to be able to flow through those things not to try to cling to something like anger but maybe that is something you pass through it might be one of the things you pass through but maybe it isn't but the idea is trying not to try not to 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 cling to that emotional state or that mindset, but to allow things to flow. Yeah, that's beautiful, man. I'm almost seeing like, there's certain states that I reached in the gym. When I knew I hit it, I felt mm-hmm. it and I could smile and I go, yes, <laughs> this is where I want to go. And I know I'm going into that place. That's almost like maybe you create that association with anger. You go, 
okay, good. Now I've got this. So anger, obviously we know, and you could, you could correct me if I'm wrong, neurochemically, we're hitting this peak of dopamine and going into norepinephrine a little bit. And now that's giving us that catecholamine rush of like a yes. anger, adrenaline. And now I'm going to, I'm going to get into that peak performance, but then what exists after that may yes. just be the greatest state. So maybe we have to go through anger to get yes. through to peak performance. Yes. Now here's an interesting part about that though. And this is what um, I hope people really take to heart. You can only do what you described, Ben, if you're properly conditioned. Yeah, yeah, for sure. You can't take somebody off the street or even a beginner or even an intermediate athlete and ask them to do that. Because what will happen is their cortisol, their cortisol levels will be so high that it's going to undercut part of their ability to recover and their ability to perform, right? Mm -hmm. So what's really important is that just as we progress load, just as we progress um, volume, uh, as we progress intensity, we also want to progress, right, that, that the ability to tap into some of these more um, intense emotional states. Because again, stress and cortisol, when inappropriately released or applied, don't serve us in terms of recovery and performance. They yep. just allow us to survive. And speaking to like what that looks like prerequisite wise, you know, I think oftentimes speaking of flow, they talk about the necessity of having this skill be unconscious, right? Mm. So that's a big part of it. Like I need to be so well practiced at this skill that I can just do it while sleeping ultimately, or while not paying attention to it. And I think the next aspect of that conditioning piece is the aerobic part. Like, you know, if, if you're, challenged aerobically again cortisol is going too high the sympathetic nervous system clicks on and the likelihood of, of consciously accessing these peak states comes down because it pulls us out of that conscious state right it pulls us into the more reactive uh, yep. you know primitive brain yep yep so then we can also think about some of these hormones that your muscles are producing as you're exercising right so these contracting yeah. muscles under specific um i'll call it um energy demands will produce hormones. And one of them that they produce is brain-derived neurotropic factor, mm -hmm. which is huge. Mm -hmm. So you've got these, these, these things that you're carrying around with you that you might be working on either, I don't know, power or hypertrophy or even endurance. They're actually producing this really critical hormone that can cross the blood-brain barrier and affect synaptic regeneration, affects serotonin production, which is huge, right? In terms of, you know, managing your, your equilibrium, your, your, your sense of, of wellness. It also facilitates um, uh, the, the, the production of new neurons in the hippocampus. So this is really big stuff that your muscles can do. Now, the trick is, as you're doing this, if you are entirely too stressed, then that starts to undermine the ability of BDNF to do what it does, right? So, so one thing you said that I just want to clarify is you know, BDNF being a myokine, and there's a whole plethora of these myokines that we'd love to get into. Yes. You said it's, it's released um, according to the energy demands on the cell. Is yes. that something we know? So is, is it, it, do we know mechanistically that that's how it happens or is it from tension? Is it from repetitive motion? Is it from like, does it have to be energy demands? So, you know, question being, if something wasn't placing a huge amount of energy demand on my body, would it still be maybe useful for BDNF? Because I, you know, I would think skill acquisition, we know that's associated with BDNF as well. So there may be multiple mechanisms. I know like the research on that I know isn't extensive, but I yeah. just want to have you talk about that a little bit. I would agree with you that there are probably multiple mechanisms. The the one that I think that is that has the longest history of research is um, the mechanism where uh, when you have um, uh, a demand for um, for more energy by that muscle cell, when that muscle cell is going, hey, wait a minute, um, we're low on, running low on energy here, right? That seems to be one of the triggers for the production of BDNF. Okay. So that's because most of the, the data is done in aerobic athletes, right? Most of it's done in endurance athletes. Well, here's the thing, though, Ben. That doesn't just happen in under aerobic conditions, right? Okay. You can have an energy demand on a cell. Anaerobic. Hey, right? <laughs> so that, Ben, is the – to your point, you're right. A lot of the research is done on, on um, uh, under aerobic conditions, but more and more of the research is starting to say, hey, wait a minute. This is not just an aerobic phenomenon. This is when that cell is recognizing, hey, wait a minute. 
And also um, uh, when there's a shift in what we call calcium homeostasis, in other words, when I'm right, as a result of that muscle contraction, you're having all this calcium being dumped into the, into the uh, intracellular matrix. And that too is going to stimulate the production of BDNF. And that happens under aerobic and anaerobic conditions. Ah, awesome. Sorry, yeah. sorry, I cut you off there. I got excited. I wanted to make sure we no clarify it because I know, you know, myself included, and I may have perpetuated this, I was very focused on increasing BDNF. I'm like, oh, I want to do stuff to increase BDNF. And I think that's useful. But Dr. Huberman, as we spoke about, also brought up the reality that it's not always uh, panacea, right? We don't always just perpetually want to have BDNF increase. But it's imp important to know, like, hey, what are my greatest levers if I'm trying yeah. to improve improve um, BNF, neuroplasticity, the brain's ability to change itself ultimately, to yes. use Norman Doidge's uh, phrase. Um, so, you know, we know that it's got to be endurance or, or at least it's got to be ch energetically challenging. It may be a skill based and it has to involve calcium dumping into the cell and also not have high amounts of cortisol. Yep. Got it. Yeah. That, that's a big deal. So, here's another thing to think about. When you have, um, say, you've got a client who says, you know what, Ben, I love working with you. I hate exercise though, can't stand it. And the only reason why I'm doing this is because I have an appointment with you. But every single rep, I'm only doing it because you're on me. This person is, rec is looking at exercise as a stress. It's something that they don't like. And therefore, when they go back to their doctor to have their, their, their cholesterol levels checked, to have their blood pressure checked, to say, how are you feeling? Are you still feeling a little depressed? They're gonna say, yeah, I still feel a little depressed. Their cholesterol won't, will not have changed their blood pressure will not have changed because they're not enjoying the experience of doing the work. So it is, it is incumbent upon us as trainers to, if we want somebody to really get the benefits of exercise, we have to design things that they actually go, huh, that wasn't as bad as I thought. I actually kind of liked that. That was cool. So if we, if we can skillfully design a bench press, a leg press, a squat, a barbell curl, a lat pull down where this person is going, I don't know what you're doing differently, but this actually feels awesome on my body. And I'm actually, I'm willing to work hard. I'm willing to do this thing that I know I need to do to transform my body. And they're actually transforming their mind. So that becomes a big deal too, is you're getting them to, to buy into this idea that I don't have to suffer to get something good for myself. Yeah. I can actually enjoy this process. Find right? joy. Yeah, so one thing you said there was that if someone is not enjoying the process they won't get a result and let's dig into that just a little bit more because you know yep. is that just mechanistically cortisol or is there other stuff happening there because like that that's a big thing right because like and i and I, I know that subjectively to be true whereas i can, like i say this all the time i can put a thousand people on the best workout in the world 900 of them are gonna gonna fall short and likely stop because and not because it's it's a, the wrong workout for them because of something that's happening in their neurochemistry and their belief system and yes. their identity all these things so yes. do we know mechanistically is it is it just cortisol preventing your brain from changing itself and then releasing all these negative associative hormones it is it is not just cortisol that is that is part of it okay so we've got this cortisol which uh, which affects um uh how bdnf uh, does its job in your body. It kind of, it, it, I don't understand the mechanism for this, but it seems to suppress the activity of BDNF. But there are other issues that come up. Um, we have a higher incidence of neurogenic inflammation. In other words, inflammation that is triggered by the sensory receptors of the nervous system. So let's say you have um, uh, uh, thinking about a shoulder and you have someone going through what we call, a, say, a full range of motion exercise. And toward the end of the ranges of their motion, they're hating this stuff, so they're not being very specific with how they're moving their body. They actually trigger inflammation. And as they trigger inflammation, the amount of force that they can produce goes down. And not only that, they may actually start to feel sore. And so that means that their volume is going to go down. So that means they can't do as much exercise, which means what? They will not hit their goal. They're, whether it's hypertrophy, strength, or endurance. It's just not going to happen because they're triggering these, these, the, this inflammation that starts with signals from the nervous system. This inflammation might be something that you can actually see or feel in terms of heat right over the joint, or it might not be something that you can see or feel at all, right? But it decreases the amount of force. It decreases the, the, um, uh, the range of motion around those joints, and that shuts down the exercise experience, right? So this, this, this need to buy into this exercise and take care as you do this exercise goes well beyond 
um, just the cortisol, right? There's this whole neurogenic inflammation side of it. Um, oh, and that doesn't even touch. And this is this is the part where it gets outside of my wheelhouse. And I'd love to talk to someone about this is how this neurogenic inflammation affects the gut and your digestion. And then also, I'd love to speak to a sleep expert about this too, right? How is this going to therefore affect your sleep? What affects your recovery and get in your preparation for the next day of working out? It's this downward spiral. It, it seems like it's not quite just as simple as the autonomic nervous system, although that's where my brain goes. It's like we're, get, we're increasing sympathetic arousal. Your brain starts to shut down digestion. Uh, you know, that's, that's where my brain goes, but I'm sure it's way more complex than that because it seems like there's so many levels of complexity in the nervous system that yes. we'll definitely uh, start asking those questions. Yes. Um, and, and Ben, here's, here's one, one more part of this that becomes very insidious too, is um, one of the ways that our brains work is it's predictive, right? It goes, what happened to me yesterday when I was under these circumstances? Oh, that's what we're about to do? So what can happen for someone is they can literally be in their car approaching the gym and their body start to get ready for that experience. That was me, man, for years. Yeah. Yep. Their bodies go, wait, this is, we're about to get beat up. Yep. Cortisol levels. <laughs> right. These, there are so many things that actually get set up just based on our brains predicting, getting ready for what's going to happen. And so here's the interesting thing is again, as trainers, we can go, Hey, wait a minute, client. I know that the last client, last time you trained, last personal training you had, when you got to leg press, it was back pain, it was knee pain, and it just wasn't great. I wanna see if we can reconstruct this so you can shift what they are anticipating and get their nervous system literally to back up and back off and give them a brand new experience. You might even have to do something creative like take them to something that they've never seen before and create the same ranges of motion and then just say, hey, look, what we just right, did right there, we're gonna do the same thing on this leg press. You just created a new context to allow them to do something different. Does that make sense? Absolutely, man, and that sounds absolutely incredible. And my brain's just going to, we all know, and I'm sure you've had clients like this who are completely resistant to uh, you know, any change. Their belief is this, and this is the way life is. Um, so is that where you would kind of start penetrating into like, hey, let's do this other thing where you don't have an association. So yes. I know that I hate this exercise. I know that I hate exercise. Okay, well, what can that's we do it. that's actually fun and make that's you go, like, hey, do you realize you just did some exercise there and then try to create some positive associations there? That's it. Um, and when I, I love when I have clients who walk in and they say, hey, Jacques, I, I, don't know, I saw this article or whatever and I, I want to work with you. I just want you to know I hate exercise. I love it when they say that because I always ask them, why do you hate exercise? And the reasons are very diverse. Sometimes it's because, you know, well, I don't know, I always felt really humiliated when I went in there. I like, you know, always felt weak or every time I did it, I got hurt. Or um, um, I don't like that. I don't like that little Bernie feeling, you know, when you're contracting a muscle, that feeling that you and I love so much, right? The one that we're addicted to. Some people hate that. And then when you dig into it a little bit more, they say, well, I hate it because I feel like it's just too much for me. I'm like, oh, okay. So then we can explore that. We can sneak up on that burn and say, hey, I got a question for you. As you're doing that now, you're starting to feel that little burn thing. And like, yeah, I start to feel that. And so I stopped. I was like, okay, that's fine. What do you think would happen if you kept going? I don't know. I think I'd hurt something. Okay. We'll leave it alone for that day. When we come back to it the next week, I'll ask him again. Well, what do you think about that? I don't know. I just felt like I could go a little bit longer. Okay, great. You feel that little burn again? Yeah. What is that exactly, Jacques? Well, actually, what we think it is, is I'll give a little bit of an idea of what we think it is. And then sometimes they'll be willing to check it out a little bit more. Before you know it, it becomes something that they're willing to explore and maybe actually walk right into. Are you with me? Absolutely. So it's, 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 it's helping people. It, if, for some goals, they might not ever need to feel that little burning thing. Right. But if they say, well, you know, I don't know, at some point I want to be a bodybuilder. So, yeah, we've got to walk them up to that. What if they have a strong association with that yet? Like the said, said, a really strong association with like my trip, my previous trainer used to kill me and my burning was so bad. I don't ever want to do that again. I threw up one time I passed out, something like that. How do we yeah. start to re-explore that, uh, that connection? Um, the, I think the, the, First thing we have to do is figure out why are you doing this in the first place? Why are you exercising in the first place? What are the specific things you want to get out of this? And um, uh, not only from a, you know, what does my body look like, 
but also I want to ask this person, Hey, look, I know um, you got a job. Okay, cool. You happy with your job? Yeah. You want to be, get a promotion? Okay, awesome. What are some of the things you're going to need to work on to get that promotion? Right. What have they said to you in the past when they passed over you? Right. So now we got something that is a, a, a physical transformation that they want, but we also have a mental transformation that they want. Now I can do just about anything that we need to in order to get them there. If I need to reacquaint them with that burn thing, I know the big picture that I can keep referring to. But the first thing I have to do is say, hey, that burn thing that you're feeling, that might not even be necessary for what we're doing right now. Because right now, I just need to, you to demonstrate control over that tissue, right? And here's the deal. As soon as you start to feel any hint of that burn, I want you to stop, right? Because we're just establishing control. Once we have control, and that also leads to trust, I can say, all right, this time what I want you to do is we're going to come up with a effort level, right? Level one is I could do this all day. Level five is I can't do another rep. What I want you to do right now is I just want you to do a level three, meaning it's kind of in the middle. That makes sense? Yeah. All right. And when we get to level three, I want to say, hey, are you feeling any of that Bernie stuff? No? Okay, awesome. And then the next time we'll go to level four. You see, see, see what I'm doing? Sure. I'm, 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 I'm empowering them to stop where they need to, but I'm also giving them a target in terms of the intensity. And then when we get to the intensity, we're starting to feel that burn thing again. I can ask them, what do you think of that burn stuff now? Are you still concerned about it like you were before? And then I go, no, I'm, for some reason, I'm not right now. And we can, we can proceed. That makes sense? Absolutely, it does, man. Absolutely. <laughs> Now, now, there's one one more part of that though, Ben, that I didn't that I, I um, that I didn't add, and that is, if this person said to me, for example, um, uh, my boss keeps telling me that the reason why I'm being passed over for um, for a promotion is I I don't know pick something I'm I I tend to I'm not I don't pay attention to details. Right. So then we can that that scale that we that we mentioned to them, we can say, here's a detail I want you to focus on. What is your experience of this? Is it a one, two, three, four, five? That is your job to focus in on that. And if we stop the exercise and they go, I don't know, I wouldn't really pay attention. Dude, paying attention to detail. Right. So we can rehearse that in that exercise, starting to pay attention to what counts, not what he wants to pay attention to, but what the job requires. Are you with me? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You, you told this to me when we spoke uh, months ago uh, about, you know, addressing people's lifestyle and psychological uh, needs, wants, desires. So if I wanted to, like you say, I want to learn how to be better at paying attention to detail, I can start doing that in the gym. So that was one great example. I don't know if you have any other that come to mind as kind of your teaching examples, but I think this... Yeah maybe the most powerful thing that exists in exercise that nobody's talking about is the ability to kind of, from, my, from the way I would explain it in layman's terms, is almost capitalize on the neuroplasticity and the opportunity of exercise to lock in these character traits or these desired attributes. Yes. Trying to find. Now, let me, let me give you one of the classic examples that we're all familiar with, right? Whether, we've, whether you've been in the military or not, right? We all know what boot camp is about, right? Boot camp is about breaking you down so that you can become part of a team so that you will receive um, uh, direction well, right? You, we are using this in a very specific way and we are taking in the whole idea of the arms forces is to take people who are very, very resistant to raise a finger to another human being in terms of you know, lethal harm and getting their minds ready to, you might have to do that now, right? So there's a very specific process they use in terms of the physicality of this training to get your mind ready for that. So we know that it works, right? Yep. So what I'm saying is that you and I can actually go, uh, for example, this is something um, um, that, that uh, I'm a new dad. And uh, I realized that there are some things, there are some, some characteristics. I was like, dude, you're going to have to work on this. One of the things that I truly had to work on was learning to be patient. I mean, I mean, like super slow patient. Like what I'm used to doing is, you know, you go in the gym, if you're doing, uh, you know, a workout with 
60 pound dumbbells one week. Next week, let's go to 70. Let's go. Let's get after it, right? Instead of having the patience to go, hey, wait a minute, maybe there's something between 60 and 70 that actually is going to allow you to do a little bit more without that little tweak in your shoulder, right? So I was able to use that idea of being patient, right? Also of being, um, being curious. Instead of being determined to go, in, oh, I know what it's like to lift up these 80-pound dumbbells. What's it going to be like today? I don't know what it's going to be like today. Let's see what this is like today. And then use just enough to move those 80-pound dumbbells. Not more, not less. Obviously not less, right? So there, there, there's tremendous opportunity to, to really yeah, transform the mind as we train. Now, one of the best examples that comes to mind is we had a, a, someone at the gym here when you're in Tampa um, who said, hey, Jacques, I'm trying to improve my deadlift. And I've been stuck at this particular weight for a long time. Do you have any recommendations? And most coaches would say, well, let me look at your form. Or they'd say, hey, let me see your periodization. And uh, what does your diet look like? And, and all these other external variables. And you asked the most brilliant question I've ever heard anyone say. And you said, what are you thinking about when you walk up to the bar? And, I was, and, and we're like, where's he going with this? <laughs> and, and you proceeded to like, just blow everyone's mind with, you know, how, what you're thinking about when you walk up to that bar, not only in the event, but in the practice leading up to the event, massively changes your ability to be successful. And I think we've talked about this a little bit in the past in the podcast, but I'd love for you to just kind of go into that example again, before we get into your seven principles of neuromuscular orchestration. Yeah. The, the idea being that, um, again, our, 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 brains are, um, they're highly anticipatory, right? They go, I know what this scenario is all about. And in some ways that serves us really well, but sometimes it kind of undermines our ability to do a little bit more, right? Because we're so fixated on what it was like in the past. And what we're forgetting about is the last time we did it, if we've been eating well, if we've been sleeping well, if we've been having a good time since last Monday into this Monday, that means that we've had some recovery. That means that this shouldn't feel like it felt last Monday. As a matter of fact, I'm not sure how it's going to feel today. So let's just be curious about it, right? We actually, we've done all the work. So why don't we just set our minds up to explore this new reality? And that's what that example is all about. Let's just see what it's like now, right? Let's rely on all this recovery, all the training we did last week, the recovery that we've done since then, and let's explore what it's allowing us to do today, right now. So I want to explore two sides of this. So, you know, some people have this belief system where they can't fail, right? So, uh, you know, that was kind of my mentality walking into the gym or walking into things in life. You know, it's the idea of seek and destroy. I decided on this objective and I, there's nothing in my way that will ever make me fail and I never fail. That's, that was awesome. my, that's my belief. Yeah. There's people on the other end of it who have failed at something a couple times and now they've created this belief walking into the gym where they build this anxiety or, or something happens in the back of their mind they go, oh, I always fail or I always fall short. One, neurochemically what's happening there. So I think on, on the positive side, it seems to be just be this big, good surge of dopamine, right? And if I'm not correct, you can correct me obviously. And on, on the negative side, what is that? What is, is it just the cortisol? Is it the neural inflammation again? Or is there something happening that shuts them down to create that belief? And how do we then reverse that belief? Yes. Okay, Ben. So check this out. So you got this person who's been coming to the gym doing their workouts and they have, like you said, a series of, of failures, right? And in those failures, their, res their, their response to that failure was, uh, oh, here we go again. This is always going to happen. Now, when you're exercising, when this person is exercising, they are still producing that BDNF stuff, right? So that means that whatever circuits they are using in that workout are being reinforced. So if their circuit that they're, that they're using is, oh, here we go again, I'm going to fail again, that literally becomes the dominant wiring in their brain, which becomes now the dominant circuit that the mind favors as they come up with their attitudes and their dispositions. So then when you meet this person and they go, Ben, I'm sick of hitting this wall, 
it's happened to me several times now. You know what the wiring is. Now you have to go through this process. It's gonna, that's going to take time to help re literally rewire their brains, help to make those circuits atrophy and help to make circuits of success hypertrophy. And that's going to take time. How much time? I don't know. I know that the, that the change begins immediately as, mean, in, as soon as they have a positive experience going in the right direction. But I know it's going to take time for those fibers to thicken, for those, for those synapses to be, get bushier, for them to become more, um, uh, for their thresholds to lower, right? And for the other circuitry to act literally high, high, uh, atrophy and start to wither away, right? So it's a process that we have to do. We have to set them up for success, continued success. So that means that as a trainer, you might have to be kind of protective and go, I'm not going to give this person that big of a jump. I'm going to make sure that this jump is smaller so they continue to experience success. Now, here's the other side of this, though, Ben. If this is a bodybuilder or an athlete of any kind, at some point, you're going to have to have a conversation with them and say, hey, listen, we all know when mistakes happen, right? We all know that life is not this linear, wonderful, you know, thing. How do you think that you'd handle a situation that's less than perfect right now? And they might go back into their, whoa, I don't know, man. Then you know they're not ready for a challenge. They're not ready for that orchestrated challenge where they might fail, right? But, you won't, but you're trying to teach them how to respond to failure in a different way. They're not quite ready yet. But at some point, you do want to create a safe environment for them to fail and to try on a new way of managing failure. Instead of it being something that just, they're out the door, something that, actually, that they actually come back from, that they try a new skill of, well, let me get creative. What do we do when that happens? We do this, right? Very, very cool, sense. man. So, yeah. So the reason we decided to do a podcast today is because I think you're teaching something that nobody else is doing. I think I know that. We both know that. Mm -hmm. And uh, you've gone ahead and created these seven principles that kind of allow everyone, I mean, whether it be a coach or someone looking to optimize their training in the mind, yes. uh, kind of a framework uh, off which of they can they can jump effectively to start to yeah. understand this. Because I think that's how our brains work. And you know, that would be the biggest thing we could offer people on today's podcast, as well as all these amazing examples. This framework you've created is absolutely fantastic, and you do an amazing job of, of describing it. So I'd love to start diving into the seven principles of neuromuscular orchestration, which is a big mouthful. But for the yeah. average person, um, just yes. walking through, let's just start off kind of going through them all, giving some examples, and, and the average yeah. person, you know, what can they expect uh, to achieve from this? So is it really just... Um, how to optimize the exercise experience with respect to the nervous system? Um, it's, it, is, uh, it is how can we get the most out of the exercise um, uh, experience, not only from um, the muscles point of view, right, and the cardiovascular system point of view, but also your mind. What's happening up in your mind? So I think of it as, as not only maximally transforming your body, but also transforming your mind, recognizing that huge opportunity. And I think about it like I remember when um, I first started personal training and I was, I was so excited. It was fun. I had all these exercises I could show people. I, you know, transformed my body. So I was excited to help people transform theirs. And then, you know, I wanted to learn a bit more. And I went and studied with this guy, uh, Tom Purvis, and had my war rocked, right? And I remember how much that just shifted the way I designed exercises the way I cued exercises, I was like, man, is this cool. And then I was like, wait a minute, there's another thing that's happening here. There, there's people always talk about how they go to yoga and they get more calm, how they go to, I don't know, a boot camp and they feel more, um, more confident, how they, um, you know, play for a team and they get all these other wonderful characteristics. And I thought, wait a minute, there's something going on with exercise. That's, the mind is shifting too, right? So I started to look at how can we start to, to, to bring all this stuff together in, a, in an organized way. Does that make sense? Completely. So it's intentional rather than, yeah, rather than subjectively uh, letting it happen to you, you can orchestrate it. Yes. It's less than, not letting it just be haphazard because I don't know about you, but um, <laughs> it's, it's a funny thing. You can have somebody who's already self-centered, um, you know, self-absorbed, 
and they exercise, and they become more self-centered and more self-absorbed, right? They love that mirror, right? No, no, no issue. That's fine. That's fine. If that's what you want to do. But if you're sitting there going, wait a minute, but I really want this promotion. And for some reason they keep saying I'm not a team player. Uh, uh. Ooh, how do I use exercise to develop that skill? Right? Yeah. Super cool, man. So yeah. walking us down the path of these seven principles. Okay. So, um, the, the first one, um, is I think the, um, um, definitely the one that, that, that is most exciting to me is when, when you're training the body, you are inevitably and inextricably training your mind. Right? So the idea being that, um, what you think about is important, right? As you're, as you're training, not only from a, um, muscular recruitment, a, um, what's happening with your hormone levels, what's happening with your digestive system. All these things are what you think about matters. Um, and one of the example I give is, uh, there's some research done by, um, Dr. Aliyah Crum and she showed that, um, um, if you give somebody a shake, right. And you tell them that it has nothing but really good things in it, their bodies have a different response to that shake. Then if you give them that same shake and you say, this is called the indulgence, it's got a lot of sugar, it's got a lot of fat, it's not good for you here, but it tastes good. Your body literally metabolizes that in a different way, right? So what we think about can actually affect matter, <laughs> yeah? Another example of this um, would be um, if someone is giving you something for pain, like morphine. If they tell you, I'm giving you something for your pain, that morphine has a high, a greater pain relieving effect than if they just gave you the morphine and didn't tell you that is, that's powerful. That's huge, man. So again, what we, what we put our minds on influences the results of what we're doing. And not only that, but when we are thinking about, um, uh, things that are uplifting, things that are, um, creative things that, um, um, help to solve problems. We are, we are starting to exercise those same circuits in our brain and those circuits actually get bigger as opposed to as if we're exercising, we're thinking about, Oh, I'm never going to get big or I'm never going to be strong. Oh, this is useless. If those are the circuits that we're thinking about, those are the circuits that are actually going to hypertrophy as we train. So we need to be careful about where we're, what, where we're placing our minds. Yeah, very cool. Yeah. So yeah, I don't have any questions on that. I think we've got, we've covered that really well, unless there's something else you want to cover before we go into two. Uh, just one thing is that, that the easiest way to get into that is to start to think about um, what are some of the attributes you'd like to cultivate as you exercise, just put your brain on it, right? Put your mind on it. And, and, and as you find, find your mind wandering off to the old patterns, bring it back to the new simple as that. I think one of the things that, um, you know, is useful for people to understand is that doesn't just happen when you're walking up to the exercise, right? This is all a process. Like you just said, you know, and I lived this for a really long time, that stress, that anxiety, that feeling of having to go to the gym. And I'm using that term intentionally having to go to the gym, um, yeah. and feeling stress and, and little anxiety about this stuff and realizing that as soon as you think about that, that place, you can start creating that positive association, that gratitude and that appreciation and seeing how I can create those positive associations as soon as I, as soon as it enters my mind. Yep. And you know what I think is the gift of the, about this, Ben, is that it comes with you when you leave the gym. It comes with you. You, you can now actually go to work and instead of going, oh, I have to go to work. You can actually develop some gratitude for going to work. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, and I think that so, so some of these things that we apply in the gym, they really do, they, they come with us as we got in the world. Yeah. Absolutely, right? Absolutely. Okay, so number two, the resolution of the nervous system is plastic. Explain that. <laughs> yeah, so what this means is um, your nervous system adapts to use. So if you think about um, uh, um, like you've got five fingers, right? And you can move them all independently. And if I were to look at a little map of my brain, I could see how if, if I'm moving one of my fingers, I could see that with this one little area of my brain, say that's, that's important for, for sensing and moving my thumb, right? But if I did something like I took a rubber band and I wrapped it around two of my fingers so they couldn't move independently, right? So every time I move my index finger, my ring finger moved too, right? 
what would happen is my brain would no longer recognize five fingers. It would recognize four fingers. Like one finger would be really big and thick, right? So that, that, that change in, in um, resolution, right? The, be able, the, the ability to differentiate this finger from that finger actually went down. We can have the same thing happening with toes and feet. You will see that some of your clients cannot move their toes independently, right? They would be these club feet, right? You have some people who can't, who who literally do not know how to flex and extend their trunk, right? They don't know how to do that anymore. It's just like kind of locked in place, and all they can do is flex and extend their hips. Are you with me? Yeah. Right. So the idea is, the more we can get people moving these in, in, these individual joints the greater the resolution is, the more control we can establish, right? Instead of having things move in these big clumps. These things are plastic. They can change, right? With injury or with repetitive use. That makes sense? Yeah, I think that's a huge one because, you know, you know, and and I know uh, all too well that most people have ingrained these movement patterns in their exercise that they feel comfortable with now. Oh, I'm pretty good at that. I do that pretty well. And you watch and you're like, oh my goodness, like you're set heading down a path of one, hurting yourself or two, uh, yes. you're not doing what you're trying to do. So we yes. need to then relearn this stuff. And I think that the yes. visual of a resolution is actually very good because I was curious as to why you use that word. And I was like, I need to understand this more, but that's perfect because it's like blurred, yes. right? It's like yes. all these ambiguous movements just happening all together yes. rather than like very precise, concise movements. Yes, that's it. So think about scapular humor rhythm. Someone whose yeah. scapular humor rhythm is broken down, their resolution has gone down, yeah. right? Their nervous system can't differentiate this from that and therefore control it precisely and start to clump things together. Yeah. Yeah, we see that a lot. Uh, in the spine is a good example, and certainly yes. differentiating shoulder movement, uh, glenohumeral humor movement from scapular movement is a big one. Yes, yes. Yeah, most, most people, Jeez. most things, we move one and the same. Yep, yep. Very, very cool. So yep. again, learning lesson for the listeners, um, understanding that the longer you've been doing something, the more you may need to slow down to, to relearn and differentiate these movement patterns. And one thing you said to me, Jacques, and, and you probably don't remember this, although you may, this was probably 2010 when I was living in California and you were wow. uh, amazingly making me feel better every day with muscle, with uh, therapy, um, with muscle therapy um, was that, Hey Ben, you should be moving every joint in your body through its entire excursion every day. And dude, that still resonates in my mind. I was like, well, how do I do that Jacques? And you're like, well, it may take some time, but you got you got to do it. Like you know, your, your fingers, your toes, your 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 you know, your shoulders through every range that you can access with control and with deliberate intention. And that that went a long way in my mind. Like how far can you take your hip through this rotation? And how far can you take your feet through this movement? And yes, um, I was very very um, uh, valuable for me. And I think that seems to tie in very very well right there. Yeah, that that you're head that's that's it. That is it. And one of the things that I continue to do, um, I realize how that's not practical to move through every single bar every day. So what I do is I have you know um, Monday is just shoulders. I just move my shoulders in every single direction that I can think of. And what's interesting is I actually found something. Right, the other day I was like, wait a minute, my shoulder flexion over on my right side doesn't feel quite the same as a sort of flex on the left side. If I can notice that from one week to the next, I'm not waiting three months to address it. I can do something about it right away. Right? So there's, there's a deeper lesson here that I think should be addressed um, because we've got the expert on, we're going to pick your brain on it. So mm -hmm. most people, let's say Jacques, that for the duration of my uh, physique journey, I've been using a certain amount of load. Let's say, you know, arbitrarily, it's, it's a relatively heavy load. And I have a psychological attachment to saying, hey, in order yeah. for me to maintain this amount of muscle, I therefore have to use the same amount of load. And there may or may not be value in that and validity in that. But I also see that, you know, be, with this load, my form becomes a little bit compromised. And some of these ranges of motion that are a little bit blurred are, uh, it's, it's, it's next to impossible for me to do it a different way. But psychologically, I have a problem decreasing the load, um, mm -hmm. right? So again, I, basically the long short of it is people need to come in and fix their form, but they're not willing to do it because of they're going to mm -hmm. decrease the weight. Um, mm -hmm. What are your suggestions there? Like as far as the integration, or should we completely remove 
that heavy load that we know is going to put us back into those blurred places? Or should we? can we still keep that in there while we also integrate the new, more precise movements? And the thing that comes to mind for me is thoracic mobility, right? Like I'd say massive percentage of my population lacks thoracic mobility uh, from probably heavy squats or, or, or whatever it may be, poor bre- breathing patterns, um, and aren't willing necessarily to use the amount of weight that's appropriate to allow them to maintain the thoracic stability and and extension or or neutral spine that they need to. Mm. So um, in in that example of a squat, um, what I'd say is it might be the lack of thoracic ability that allows you to do that load. Right, exactly. Yes. So so then if the idea is that you still want to have the thoracic mobility, but you'd still like to do that load, I'd say that just means that you have to add more exercises to your routine. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So you've got your squat, but you go, in order to do that, I have to have basically have this isometric contraction in this one position. So now I need to actually develop exercises that allow me to move my thoracic spine, right? That's where you would psychologically tolerate lower loads because it's not something you're used to. Right. So what I would do is I would be designing specific exercises for you to do probably some thoracic extension and rotation, right? Um, Making, uh, I'd probably have um, exercises where I'd make the shortest end the hardest and then other work, other exercises where I'd make the longest end the hardest part of the exercise, right? So right there, right? Where you've been like, Push really hard right there, and then as you get back here, it would back off. And then other times it would be really hard right here and easy right there. Are you with me? Yeah. So I think that's where I'd have the greatest opportunity, not trying to take your load away from you, but saying, okay, if you want that, I'm still going to set up another scenario where you have to move these other things. I like that a lot. Now, yeah. this just opens up a different rabbit hole, but can you talk just really quickly why you chose lengthen and shorten? Yes. Um, yeah. Um, two reasons, um, uh, maybe three. Uh, one is that um, when we look at uh, the shortened end of the range of motion, that's typically where you get fatigued the fastest. Um, it is also where we have, um, for those of us who enjoy the sensation of muscle contraction, that's where we get our greatest satisfaction. That's where it feels the best to us, right? And the lengthened end of the range of motion is where we typically will fatigue um, slower, but it's also where um, we have the greatest opportunity, if you want to look at it that way, to create mechanical tissue damage. The stuff that we typically uh, associate, one of the things we associate with hypertrophic changes. Um, That's typically where it happens is is in the lengthened third of the range of motion of the tissue, not of the joint but of the tissue, right? So you get out there and you're loading that lengthened third, um, especially eccentrically, you're gonna get some soreness out there, most likely, okay? Um, So when I think about the spectrum of of sensations and changes, tissue changes that we expect as, you know, um, people who like hypertrophy and strength, that's why I think about those two two ends of the range. So just a different psychological sensation so that you get that, Uh, expected or that maybe desired feeling yeah yeah Yeah. and not only that but but i also want to make sure that when i go to that length and third that i've got the ability for the exercise basically just to i want the resistance to really drop off quickly because that's where we are uh, potentially exposed to that neurogenic inflammation on that lengthened end, right? If we lose control. And as we go to the shortened end, we could also have some neurogenic inflammation there because for the one side of the joint is shortening, the other side is lengthening. So depending on the shape of the joint and the, and the, um, the connective tissues around that joint, I might have a huge oppor- opportunity for neurogenic inflammation there as well. Perfect. Thank you. And sorry about the tangent, but so coming back okay. to uh, point number three of the seven principles. Yeah, so number three, the sensitivity of the nervous system is dynamic, and that kind of dovetails what what, what we were just talking about. In other words, you have somebody who is at the very beginning of their training cycle. You know, you've been off. You're a bodybuilder. You're an athlete of any kind. You've taken some time off at the beginning of your training cycle. Your nervous system is probably not going to be that sensitive. In other words, you could do a lot to it, and it's not going to say, hey, you better back off, right? You get deeper into your training, Right where you're really starting to lift lots, lots of loads, you're starting to move a lot faster. Um, you're getting the intensity is ramping up. 
your nervous system might start to say, look, as you get to the end of your range of motion, we're a little bit more cautious back here. We're a little bit more beat up. We're going to start to turn on the warning bells, right? And this is where, again, the neurogenic inflammation can start to tell you, hey, look, bud, you're, we're, we're just about done. You can ignore us if you want to, but that means you're going to need more than a week to recover, right? And that's the cycle that a lot of people get stuck in is they train so hard that they need more than a week to recover, but there's no way they're going to give themselves a week to recover. There's no way, right? They're back at it, back Monday, doing it again, right? Yeah. Do you have any data on, on duration of time for neurogenic um, inflammation decreasing? I guess there's so um, many variables, right? <laughs> yeah, man. This uh, from from nutrition to to sleep to um, which joint is it? Is it your foot? Is it your knee? Yeah. Right? Versus is it your shoulder? What are you doing? Yeah. Um, but yeah, so that's the sensitivity is is about um, when do when do the caution lights and when do the stop lights come on? Yeah, very, very cool. So number four. The mobility of the nervous system is key to posture and motion. So we rarely think about what has to happen to, say, the sciatic nerve as you go from, say, a neutral position to hip flexion with knee extension, right? We know what happens to the hamstring, right? The hamstring has to lengthen. But what about that sciatic nerve? It has to do something, and it doesn't stretch. It actually uncoils, right? So if in its uncoiling, it can't uncoil properly, it starts to get some tension on it. And you're going to start to feel some discomfort, right? And what's interesting is that it could be snagged at a, at a bunch of different points along that length. And this is not the, 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 the appropriate you know, time to get into that. But you need to know that if that sciatic nerve can't uncoil the way it needs to, that is going to inhibit your ability to, say, straighten out your knee and maybe even dorsiflex your foot, right? which might affect your ability to do those knee extensions. So what would inhibit it from uncoiling? Um, it could be that you've got some connective tissue that is, um, that it's snagged around it. or, um, uh, yeah, something that was trying to heal up. And so it got a little sticky and now the, the, the sheath that usually slides right past the muscle can no longer do that. Right. Um, it's, it's pretty interesting. You can have the same thing up in the upper extremity too with your arms as you start to bring your arms out to the side and even your cervical position. If you will see some clients and they tend to turn their head just a little bit one way and tilt their chin up, it might be that they're trying to compensate for the lack of uncoiling of some of those nerves in their upper extremity that go out to their hands. Got it. So talk to me about that because nobody's ever talked about mobility of the nervous system. And, and we all know it's a real thing because we've all felt that stretch that feels like it's a nerve stretching. Yeah. Um, is it something that is um, obviously necessary to keep up? Is there, is there a daily practice? It, what, how intense can we endure that neural stretching? Is it going to cause damage and things like that? Yeah. Um, well, well, first I want to, I want to refer everybody to, um, to an author. His name is David Butler and he is um, the guy in terms of the mobility of the nervous system. As far as, as far as I know, um, he's written several books, any one of them, they're fantastic, but yes, um, uh, nerves are designed, some of them are designed to withstand great changes in both pressure and tension. Um, others, not so much, right? So for example, um, your nerve that happens to go, um, that, that little funny bone nerve that uh, in your elbow, um, that, that nerve has to, um, withstand a lot of compression because of where it is, right? Um, whereas your sciatic nerve doesn't really have to do with a lot of compression along most of its length. Okay, so this idea that can you tolerate some of that strain? Yes, you can tolerate some of that strain, but again, your nervous system is gonna say, look, there's strain on me. I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna let you dial up as much force as you want in those tissues. So you can beat it up all you want. And sure, you might not lose sensation down, your, down to your foot, but you're not gonna be able to produce the force that you want because your nervous system is gonna say, I'm sorry, I'm not gonna let you have it. And that's why this leg is bigger than that one. We'll definitely look up that resource, but is, you know, is stretching the solution? Is tissue quality the solution? Like, is it mostly a mechanical thing or is it also a chemical thing? It's a mechanical and a chemical thing. And I don't think that we've got all the answers about how to get it moving again. But I'll say that um, the mechanical side of it is really, really quite interesting. Um, and this is something that we need to look at, like, in person. But if you think about it, like... You've got this length of tissue that goes from, say, your, from your sacrum down to the bottom of your foot, okay? 
And somewhere along that link, there's a kink and you don't know where it is. So what could you do? Are there things that you could do with your hip, keep your hip in position while you move, move your knee, right? To see if it's between the upper section. And then if you keep your hip in one position, your knee in another position, and now move your ankle around, see if there's a kink between, see what I mean? So we can, we can go through this process of saying, where's the kink? And is there anything we can do mechanically to kind of floss it out, mm -hmm. to tease it back into motion, right? So would this be an argument for or against foam rolling? I would say that it would be an argument, um, hmm. or, or just not even bring up foam rolling to begin no, with. No, 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 not at all, not at all. It would be something where you'd say uh, you'd have to set up a, a, a situation. Where you go. My hypothesis is when I foam roll right here, that is going to allow this nerve to glide a bit more. So when I go back and do this thing, I won't feel that anymore. Give it a shot, right? The question though is. If that same thing keeps happening every day, why is your body choosing to create that same point of friction over and over and over again, mm -hmm. right? So you might need to look at your, uh, your exercise design to figure out that part. Super interesting. Um, so much that could be explored there, right? So mobility is a big, big issue in, mm -hmm. in, in the world. And most people assume it's a muscular issue. Do you think, most people's mobility has to do with more about muscle, muscle length or nervous system length. And what would be, as you say, what would be some of the causes of the shortening and these adhesions or these, these sticking points? Is it, is it just repetitive stress or is it direct trauma? What seems to be, or obviously maybe all of them. Um, what are your, some of your thoughts? Uh, I would say uh, those two things for sure. Uh, um, specific trauma, whether it's, you know, falling on a, on tissue or a tissue that's been strained, um, that's in proximity to some nervous system tissue that usually typically glides right past it. Um, I'm trying to think of what else. Uh, you might have certain um, issues in terms of nutrition, right? Your ability to, for that tissue to repair. Um, how would you know if it's a, a nerve or if it's more con connective contractile tissue that's creating the issue with you moving? I think the, the, the best thing, the, the, the clearest thing is the sensation. Um, the, that kind of pins and needles, um, uh, prickly, burning. Um, it can actually, uh, the other thing, it can actually, actually feel cold. It can feel like almost like a cooling sensation. That usually is an indication that there is some sort of tension on this nervous system, right? on that nervous tissue, I should say. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Would you advocate foam rolling or not? I know a lot of people are going to go, well, why didn't you ask about that? Is that something you, it, I know it's just a tool and, and yeah. a tool in your tool, tool belt, but in general, everyone's always looking for the answer. No. Yeah. What is your thought and opinion on that with respect to its ability to negatively impact the nervous system? Yes. It's, um, the, the, the way I think of that tool is um, uh, it, it is a tool that I've never needed to use to help people get what they need. Got it. And on the other side, when I think about it, um, it creates um, what we know that it does under um, at least at least a little bit better than chance, a little bit better than chance. It actually creates temporary decreases in the amount of tension that the tissue can produce. Okay, these are temporary changes, but we don't know how long the changes last. Right. So if you were about to do an activity, I wouldn't say go foam roll. Right? Because if you're doing an activity, the last thing you want to do is decrease the amount of force that the tissue can produce. Yeah. Yeah. My thought being um, some compressive stuff, right? If I'm, if I'm sitting on this thing or if I'm rolling on it, potentially compressing the nerve and causing this thing to tighten up or, or, or in some way negatively impact the muscle. Yeah. I would say that um, the, the, my, like from my, my rational brain says my biggest issue that I have with a foam roller is how nonspecific it is. We have no idea what it's crushing into. And how much, how much of that force is going straight on, for example, your, your sciatic nerve, right? And that sciatic nerve, that length of it, it's not, it's not built for that kind of smushage, right? That's not what it's built for. It's built, for, it's built to withstand more tension than it is that, that trans, that, that, I guess, um, that crushing force. Mm -hmm. So that would be my concern there. Awesome. So we're on to number five. Yep. In order to perform an exercise, the nervous system must determine which muscles or motor units are best suited for the task and then recruit them. 
So your nervous system has to go, okay, there's a quadricep down there. And that quadricep is made up these, of these things called motor units, right? And a motor unit is just a group of, of muscle cells and this alpha motor neuron sitting in the spinal cord that says, hey, muscle contract, right? So you've got hundreds of those motor units in your quadricep and your brain has to go, hey, this exercise we're gonna do, should I use the vastus medialis, lateralis, intermedius, rectus femoris, or combination of them? And then of that combination, who should I get in there first? And you know what's cool, Ben, is when we put EMG probes on people doing a leg press, we watch a change in the recruitment pattern of those muscles. You might start off with a lot of vastus lateralis and finish off with lots of vastus medialis, right? Right. So talk to me about this because this is the most interesting thing. So first, um, how different do you find it to be person to person? It's all over the place. Yeah. And it also depends on what their sport is, right? Are they a bodybuilder or are they a runner, right? Are they a gymnast or are they uh, um, a crossfitter? Man, you got all, it's, it's so fascinating. And that's why when I think about like coming up with a dialed in, customized workout for someone, and they're, when they really are saying to me, hey, look, dude, I want this thing right here to be bigger. Or why is this muscle so big on me? And that one's just like not there. We go, okay, let's, let's see you do what you do. Mm-hmm. Well, that's why. If we want to do something different, here's what we're going to do. Because when we put you over here, do you see how this thing jumped in first? Awesome. Right? It's really cool, man. And, and the thing that's fascinating about it is that it's your nervous system that is orchestrating this stuff. It's going, wait a minute, based on what I know about you, how we're put together, what we did yesterday, here's who I think we should be in this game. How much can we change it? Uh, tremendously. It is um, about changing the context, right? So your brain can't predict all the time, right? Because if your brain can predict too much, it'll go, oh, I know who I'm going to use. But if we can make the context look different enough, your brain will be like, back at square one. Okay, who should I use? Who should I use? Right? And then we have an opportunity to get it to use something different. Are you with me? Yeah. Um, the other thing that can be, that can help change the way the brain orchestrates the stuff is change the direction of force. A lot of it's based on need or change how long the force is imposed. Right? So. Yeah. So where this relates to the listener is, is if you're looking to build a quote unquote weak body part, and I always use the, the quotations, right? is it's yeah. absolutely possible. You just have to change what you've always done. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Big time. Um, you have to change what you've always done. And, 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 and that, that is, that is incredible wisdom right there. At the same time, you need to be cognizant of all the ways you can change what you've always done. It doesn't have to necessarily be more volume or load right? It could simply be the direction of the force. It could be the position that you're going through. It could be the length of the tissue that you are training, right? Yeah, I think a lot of people create this negative association with change because we're so comfortable being comfortable. Uh, we want it to be, I want to be really good at this. And I think, you know, to use one of your tactics to create an association where you say, hey, when I'm doing this in a new way, not only am I training this muscle differently, so therefore I'm getting stronger in a different way, but I'm also training my brain in a different way, <laughs> right? And I think giving people that association. So every time I do something new in the gym, I'm t- trying to do something new every single day. Like, yeah. and I know, because every time I do something new, my brain is, is growing. My brain is developing new pathways. And, yes. and, you know, I may do something, you know, for 30 days and do it over and over and over and over and over again. And then it becomes ingrained and let's learn something else. Mm-hmm. Yep. Cool, man. Let's move on to number six. Okay, number six. Uh, the motor units and the muscles recruited by the nervous system to perform uh, an exercise must produce adequate energy to generate the required tension and power. So your nervous system says, I want my quads, I want my glutes, and I want my hamstrings to do this thing. And now these muscles actually have to go about providing the power, the energy that's needed to generate the force that the nervous system is asking for. So um, that's where you start to get changes in the mitochondrial density, right? Because your body goes, hey, wait a minute, we got to do this for a longer period of time, or we get changes in in, in the amount of creatine that is sequestered and stored away, right? So we have to think about not only is your system changing from the standpoint of which muscles are being recruited, but also the intracellular machinery that allow you to do what you do, right? Um, it, is, um, it still blows me away how many people who um, are interested in hypertrophy training 
don't see the relationship to cardiovascular training, right? It's just never been taught, right? And I think it's just not, it's just not emphasized. It's funny how, you know, powerlifters and bodybuilders have this badge of honor, but I don't do cardio. And they see it as, oh, I don't eat clothes to lose fat, but it, it has nothing to do with that in most That's cases, right. right? And they just don't get That's it. Right. Yep. Yep. Um, so yeah, that, that, that's a, uh, that's a pretty straightforward one. It is. Um, and it isn't, man. I, I think people don't realize that it's the nervous system's inability to produce ATP that usually makes you stop and exercise. Right. And you explained that to us on a previous podcast was, uh, you know, people talk about the nervous system becoming fatigued and you're mm-hmm. like, well, that doesn't usually happen. It's usually mm-hmm. just the inability to, to produce ATP and ultimately replenish ATP fast enough, which is then yep. the job of the aerobic system. Like you say, yep. Um, there, there's one thing though, uh, that, um, this is a little bit of a rabbit hole, but I, 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 this is, I think an important thing. Um, there's a specific population that will be referred to a lot of trainers. Um, and those are people who are, um, borderline diabetics, right? And their, their doctor will say, you need to go exercise so it can reduce your blood glucose. And what's really interesting is, and people, when people have elevated blood glucose levels, um, what happens is the amount of acetylcholine that is sitting at the neuromuscular junction, right? The, 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 the neurotransmitter that actually tells the muscle to contract, that neurotransmitter is actually reduced, right? So instead of saying, let's say it had like five molecules of acetylcholine, that's what's supposed to be there. There's only going to be three, right? So if you only have three molecules of acetylcholine being released, then that muscle muscular contraction is not going to be quite as robust, right? You're not going to get as much tension, which means you're going to have to ask that muscle to contract more often. Are you with me? Okay. Yep. So this person who, who is borderline diabetic, they're coming into the gym to work out. If you really put them through the paces on day one or even on day five, you're going to crush them, right? Because their neuromuscular system is not ready to do that. So that's one of the situations where we have to realize that it's not just the uh, metabolic issues within the muscle cell, but it's actually the communication to the muscle cell that is also compromised. Very interesting, man. I think that's important for people to know. Um, I'd love to finish off and learn about number seven. Yes, yes. The nervous system coordinates the cardiovascular, metabolic, and endocrine responses required to support the activity of the neuromuscular system. So I just wanted um, folks to realize that if there's an issue with what's going on with their cardiovascular system or the endocrine system, having some sort of hormonal issues, or they're not eating well, then your nervous system can be doing its best to try to orchestrate the muscular system but it's kind of operating with, with one hand tied behind its back, right? So as much as the nervous system will try to orchestrate this motion, it is only going to give you as much as it can that's based on its ability to get what it needs from those other systems. So when you are, and then we all know this, when you're, when you're not sleeping well, when you're not eating well, right, your nervous system can be trying to recruit those muscles, but you're just not going to get what you, what you should out of them. So mostly a recovery thought, like making sure you're, you're replenishing calories, you have the adequate minerals and, and uh, micronutrients there, and you're getting the right uh, modalities of, of recovery for the nervous system, you know, obviously sleep and yeah. something parasympathetically oriented. Yes. And recognizing that um, um, if, this, if there's an issue, say, with your cardiovascular system, that is going to impact your neuromuscular system's ability to do what you want it to do. Okay. And so valuable. So yeah. as we spoke about just before getting started, we would love to have you out to teach this course. And I think people after hearing this realize what's missing. And I think to sum it all up in my words, and I'd love to you to do the same is, you know, if you're, if you're exercising, you're not enjoying it. And if you're exercising, you're not seeing the opportunity to make it a mindful activity. If you're not seeing the opportunity to change your mind and your body at once, and ultimately accelerate this uh, ability to improve your life because you're increased, you're exposed to an increased neuroplasticity. Um, if you don't see those benefits, you're not capitalizing on a daily basis, especially as a coach, you're missing a massive piece of this puzzle. And as a coach, you're also missing a massive piece of the puzzle of changing somebody's life because some people come to the gym and they have to, and they don't want to, and they don't get the results they want. And you as a coach are kind of handcuffed and going, well, I'm not really sure what to do. I'm here to yell at you and work you hard. But in reality, this is, you're missing a huge chunk of how you can actually elicit the response and the change. 
That's right. That's it. Is um, I think for 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 many years, myself included, um, for many years when I watch clients fail, they would come to me in January, right? Right. I got to lose the weight. It's a new year, and they were done by March. You know, and what did I say when they didn't buy more sessions and we had a good relationship? Oh, they just didn't want it. They're just too. It's too lazy. Right. Man. You know, it was them. Right? right. When what I didn't do was construct an environment where they actually were engaged in the exercise. I allowed them to put on their earbuds and tune out or talk about football in between each set, right? I allowed that, I, I just used my personality to make it, hey, hey, right? Instead of really allowing them to engage in this process of shifting their body and then giving them something that was bigger than just the, 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 the physical change, giving them something that's actually gonna leave the gym with them, right? The changes of the mind. I think including, seven to 10 case studies of how what you actually did and how you would approach it would make yeah. this really real for people. Because I think conceptually it makes sense. It's like, Oh, I can do really cool stuff. But I, the, the level of understanding you have of this is uh, so extensive. And I think our listeners won't quite get it until you're able to throw out like these seven to 10 examples and case studies. So their brain can start to understand. I'm happy to, happy to, happy to do that. And so why don't we, why don't we commit then to doing that on your social media Cool. And people can go and follow you on Instagram over yeah. the next month. And if they want to join you at, here at the MI40 gym in March, then they can head over to your site and, and sign up. That's awesome. That is awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I will do that. Um, yeah, I know you're, you're, you're giving me some amazing examples that my brain took a few minutes to wrap around. So it'd actually be great to have that video recorded so they can watch it over and over again on, you know, say you do it on IGTV or something. So they get the longer yeah. video explaining how to apply it. Yes. Uh, I think that will get people excited about this stuff as much as I am because you know, ultimately, man, changing your body without changing your mind is what I went through for the first 20 years of my life. And you realize you get to this, this place and you're like, oh, I look the way I want to look, but I don't feel the way I want to feel. I'm not happy. I'm not fulfilled. And it's missing. You just said it. You just said it. And, um, man, yeah. And conversely, even if someone doesn't even want to massively change their body, even if they just want to improve their quality of life, their quality of their thoughts, and you know, we have to live with ourselves every day. We have to live with our thoughts. And, and right. it's so empowering to realize that, yes, you can change them. Yes, you can accelerate this by right. having increased BDNF neuroplasticity uh, That's right. from exercise. That's right. There's, there's so many things that um, we all experience daily where we go, man, I wish I wasn't like that. Or, man, I wish I... I wish I had more whatever so that I could, so I could manage the situation in a different way. Yeah. And you, there is a place where you can work on that safely without judgment where you will come up with a solution and it is in the gym. We can do this and we can stay within our, within our um, uh, scope of practice, right? We're not a therapist. That's not what I want to be, right? Not at all, but we can come up with the attributes, the attitudes, the behaviors that you need to succeed. Let's apply them in the gym. Let's apply yeah. them. Man, I think there's so much value there. And to be honest, my head still doesn't quite wrap around it because it's so far outside of what I normally think about. But to be yeah. honest, that's exactly how I felt when I first heard Tom Purvis speak about yeah. exercise. I was like, well, I've got this far with exercise and I've done pretty well. And you hear him speak and you go, I see the tremendous value, but my brain doesn't still like default to understanding it right away. So I think yeah. putting it into those practical terms of going, hey, here's how I did this. Here's an example of how you would do it. Here's a, yeah. here's a trait that, you know, if you want to acquire this, here's how you would in, in practice do this in the gym. Doing yes. that on your social and allowing okay. people to anchor to that will be the fastest way for people to go, oh my goodness. Because in theory, it makes so much sense. And you're like, yeah, I got it. But I can't conceptualize yet in my mind. Yeah. Like, what, would I, what if I wanted to become a, a, a little bit more patient like you? Yeah. Or if I wanted to become... A little yeah. more calm or maybe a little more joyful a little more happy and then how would that translate into my life it's not plain as day yeah yeah that's cool I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna I will definitely um, start to do that um, and I'll just just one thing that I that I do uh, this is not for public consumption but I use an app I designed an app basically that that I use um, that allows me to for every rep right I've got what where I want to be placing my mind right and um, just like um, for um, um, I hypertrophy workout, 
um, you would have to gradually build to go into failure on every single set, every single rep, right? If that's what you want to do. You also need to build to this kind of mindfulness, right? You can't, you, you're not going to do this right away. You might be mindful on one rep of a whole set or just on one set, right? Of your exercise. But the idea is to expand how much, how long you are focusing your mind, right? Do you think um, it would be useful? Um, this is just getting my brain spinning about the gym and, and my coaching app that I'm watching. Um, would it be useful to create maybe a daily theme of say, hey, today, Jacques, during our workout, we're going we're gonna, to uh, train focus. And so just keeping that word front of, front of mind during your workout and like, yes. what does focus look like? What is it? And maybe a little video. So that's right. That's right. It's, it's, it's that. And it's all, and it's with the caveat that these things like, okay, I'll tell you one of the things I'm working on. I call it courage, right? Now, courage to some people, they might go, well, that means, you know, standing up to the bully. I'm like, well, yeah, that's true. That's true. But in my life personally, what courage is for me, where I need to be able to be better is sometimes saying to people that was hurtful. What you just said was really hurtful. You know, that, um, that's always been hard for me to, 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 to speak up when someone is, you know, coming at me pretty hard, you know? Um, and, and that to me, takes courage to, to, to say that knowing that someone else is going to have a reaction that may not be, you know, right. Very, so you should nice. train that in the gym. Heck yeah. Give me an example. Okay. So when I'm going to do, uh, let's see, um, I'll give you an example. Yeah. So my, my leg press, right. I get on there. I load it up the way I always do. Right. And, uh, I looked down at my little chart. This is what I'm supposed to do here. I start to do this and starts to feel really uncomfortable. Starting to see some tightness on my, in my back on the left side, you know, starting to get uncomfortable. My knee is starting to click a little bit over the right side. Now, old Jacques would be like, you know what? Just deal with it. Just keep going. Deal with it, right? It's painful. It's not comfortable. You're not going to stop. But what I do now is I stop, I put it up there and I go, okay, what can I do to make this different? Because that was not comfortable. I have the courage to actually stop and not be afraid that if I stop, I'm, you know, I'm wussing out or, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, doing something wrong and then to make a small adjustment and go, okay, how is that? That's better. Okay, let's go. Let's keep going. Right. So that to me is just opening that little space to have the courage to acknowledge when something is uncomfortable and do something about it. I love it, man. There's so much yeah. value in that. And I could see that applying, you know, I've got a few female clients coming to mind where I'm like, boom, we could, we could train this. I've got a female clients coming to mind. Boom. We could train that. And usually people are looking for different things and I can kind of see how it's just sticking that thin end of the wedge in the door. Right. It's like, how do we yeah, get yeah. their brain to start? Oh yeah. I have a little, I have a little bit of courage. I do it with my kids all the time. I see, I'm seeing this with my son, right? Like how could I apply this to my kids? So yeah. I often like to refer things back to because most parents, you know, have some association to making their kids better. And yeah. we spoke about the lactic acid and my son and I often go on bike rides and he's mm. really negative association with all the birding. Ah, uh, yeah. So I need, I need to kind of stick the thin end of the wedge in the door there and allow him to feel powerful enough to stop when it burns yep. rather than being like, Hey buddy, you got this, you know, and yep. he, really, he really doesn't like it. <laughs> Anyways, man, I appreciate your wisdom so much, buddy. And so if people oh, want okay. to learn more from you, um, Instagram, what's your website? Yep. Uh, so Instagram, myotopia. Uh, is where you can find me. And the website is fns.training. fns.training. Is that the course as well that you're going to be bringing to? Tampa? Yeah. Yes. Uh, there's information about the course up there um, under courses. The, uh, I think it's the very first course that will come up. Um, uh, the idea is that we're looking at, um, yeah, these seven principles of neuromuscular orchestration. So people find this information on the website too, the seven principles. Yes, they're there. They it's are there. there. Awesome, yes, man. Perfect. Thank you so much, Jock. And man, I, I can't wait to have you back on the show already. And hopefully we get to do some more cool stuff together this year. Yeah, it's always a pleasure, Ben. Thanks for having me on. Now, what are your greatest takeaways from that beast of an episode? I hope you're taking notes. If not, go back and listen again, because there is some gold in life-changing opportunities that exist within that conversation. As I said, and as I promised, Jock is a wealth of information. And I'm so, so grateful to call him a great personal friend. Absolutely love this guy. And every time I talk to him, it just blows my mind to hear his incredible wisdom. Now I will reveal to you because you're listening to this podcast and 
I don't want to announce to anybody else. Jacques is going to be doing a seminar, a course, in fact, at my gym in Florida. And it's only two days. And there's a very limited amount of space. And if you're someone who's an exercise professional, or if you're someone who look, who's looking to create an exercise program designed for your body, for your needs, that allows you to create your greatest life, this is something you do not want to miss. You can check it out on my Instagram. So by the time this podcast is released, it will be a post on my Instagram. I suggest you look through my highlights because I will put it there as well. And again, we're only going to take about 15 people. So it's super limited. Maybe if we're, if we're getting pressured, we'll take up to 20, but that's it. And it's going to be super exclusive and super fun. And I will definitely be there learning from Jacques, just like you. And I look forward to connecting with each and every one of you. I'd love to hear what your greatest takeaways were, what you're using to apply. And if you have any questions for myself or Jacques, you can check him out at Myotopia, M-Y-O-T-O-P-I-A is his Instagram. And obviously, you know where to find me, Instagram. And please head over to iTunes to leave us a review and give us a follow. Have an amazing day, ladies and gents. I absolutely love you. I appreciate you so much. I hope you live your greatest life in a body that fuels you around this planet like an adventure. Have a great day. Thank you so much for tuning into Muscle Intelligence. If you enjoyed today's episode, please be sure to share it with at least one person you know. Make sure you're subscribed so you never miss an episode. This podcast is for information purposes only. The statements and views on this podcast are not medical advice. This podcast, including Ben Bikulski and the producers, disclaim responsibility for any possible adverse effects from the use of information contained herein. Opinions of guests are their own, and this podcast does not endorse or accept responsibility for statements made by guests. This podcast does not make any representations or warranties about guest qualifications or credibility. This podcast may contain paid endorsements or advertisements for products or services. Individuals on this podcast may have a direct or indirect financial interest and products or services referred to herein. If you think you have a medical problem, consult a licensed physician.